Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day, Lord. And Father, we look forward to the things you're going to show us tonight as we go through Romans chapter 3, just those lessons we need to learn. And Father, just your wonderful gift you've given to us, that you've forgiven us of all of our sins. You've cast them as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more, and we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we just pray again for our worship. We want to honor you. We want to praise you. And Lord, may our hearts just be open to the things you have for us. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3 as we're continuing our study through the Word of God. And as we've seen in our previous studies, Paul, in a sense, is acting as a prosecuting attorney. And what he's doing is he's condemning the whole world before God because of their sin. We saw in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, Paul showing how the unrighteous heathen are condemned by creation. In Romans 2, verses 1 through 16, we saw how the self-righteous moralist is condemned by their own conscience. And lastly, in Romans 2, verses 17 through 29, Paul shows how the super-religious person is condemned by the law of God. Now, as we will see in Romans 3, verses 1 through 20, Paul is going to condemn all humanity that no one can stand before God in their own righteousness, no matter how good they are or may seem to be. All are guilty before God, but Paul's not going to leave us in that condition with no way out. And then from Romans 3.21 through really Romans 5.21, Paul's going to speak about justification and how the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven apart from the works of the law. Now, before we get to our text this evening, let me share this with you because it'll kind of shed some light on where not only the Jews are, but Gentiles are as well. Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Emperor's New Clothes, is among everyone's favorite because of its humor and because of the point it so aptly makes. We probably all know the story. A certain emperor was very fond of appearances and clothing. So when certain clever philosophers, actually they were con men, offered to weave him a rare and costly garment, he was quite receptive. He especially liked their promise that the garment would be invisible to all but the wise and pure in heart. The delighted emperor commissioned his new clothing at great cost, and the con man men sat before the empty looms and pretended to be weaving. Soon the emperor's curiosity became such that he sent his chief minister to see how things were going. Seeing no cloth on the busy looms and not wanting to be thought unwise and impure in heart, the official returned with a report about the fabulous beauty of the cloth. After a time, the weavers asked for more money. Again, the emperor became impatient, sending his second chief minister, who returned with an even more enthusiastic report. Next, the emperor went himself. Though he too saw nothing, he did not want to appear stupid, so he proclaimed the clothing excellent and beautiful. He even gave the weavers medals. Finally, on a day set for the grand parade, the con man dressed the emperor in his nakedness and then skipped town. As the emperor paraded before his people, en naturel, the whole populace joined in praising his beautiful new clothing, lest they should be thought of as fools and knaves. Thus the observed parade continued, until in a moment of quietness, a child was heard to say, The emperor has no clothes! At once everyone knew the truth, including the emperor. One innocent but honest remark by a small child who did not know enough to keep his mouth shut stripped away the hypocritical pretense of the entire nation. The emperor's new clothes is such a great story that we use the term proverbially to describe a common tendency. We, we remain quiet while a fallacy is being promoted to which everyone is subscribing because we do not want to be thought of as fools. As we approach the third chapter of Romans, we must keep in mind that it well describes the condition of the Jews whom Paul has just been addressing. The Jews imagined themselves to be clothed with a righteousness that was actually non-existent. They were duped by a misleading religious confidence. So Paul, like the little boy, stripped away their layers of delusion. They believed because they possessed the word of God they were saved. They saw themselves as guides to the blind, correctors of foolishness, teachers of immature. But Paul unaddressed them, proving that having God's word is no guarantee of life. Paul also stripped away their errant confidence in circumcision, showing that their religious affiliation would not save them. As he undressed his fellow Jews, he also undresses us, stripping away our misleading confidence and having God's word in our right affiliations. 
for all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, true righteousness is a matter of the heart. Here's the thing, guys. If you are standing before God in your own righteousness, thinking he's going to accept that, you are totally wrong. Your righteousness is like filthy rags before a holy and righteous God. You're naked. All your sins are exposed before him. And it's only when we're clothed in, with the righteousness of Christ that we're no longer naked before God. All our sins have been covered in the blood of Christ. And that's what Paul's been showing us over the last few weeks. We're all naked before God. Our sins are exposed. As Paul's going to say, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So with that in mind, let's pick up Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chief, chiefly because them, to them were committed the oracles of God. Now, as we've seen in Romans 2, verses 17 through uh, 29, Paul has explained that the super-religious person, the Jews, were condemned by the commandments of God. In other words, having the law, being circumcised, is not going to save a Jewish person, or for that matter, anyone. And that kind of leads us to what Paul is saying here in Romans 3.1. Paul is asking the question that some may have regarding the Jews. And the question is simple. If that's true, then what advantage is there to being a Jew? And then Paul answers that question in verse 2 of Romans 3. He says, there is an advantage of being a Jew for the oracles, the words of God, were entrusted to them. It's the past tense, but it was still a privilege, an honor to have the words of God entrusted to them. The problem was they didn't apply those things to their life, and thus they were accountable to God. And Paul's going to expound on this idea of the blessings the Jews received from God when we get to Romans chapter 9, so we'll deal more with that then. But just keep in mind, yeah, there was that advantage. God had chosen the Jewish people to be his instruments to shine his light through. Now, as Christians, let's put ourselves in their shoes. We have been entrusted with so much by God, and it's an advantage if we apply these things to our lives, if we can live what we say we believe. Otherwise, it's head knowledge. That doesn't save anyone. It doesn't help you in your walk with God. One writer put it like this. He said, they were people of spe special privilege. God had revealed his word to them. We are people of spe special privilege in that God has given us his word. Tonight we are here to study the word of God. And that is a tremendous advantage to have the word of God. An advantage if you keep the word of God and live by the word of God. But if you don't keep the word of God, if you don't live by the word of God, then having the word itself is not an advantage, but in, re in reality, a responsibility. And you have a greater responsibility knowing the will of God than a person who has never known the will of God or the word of God. Absolutely. Now, look at verse 3 here. This is the next question that uh, Paul anticipated them asking. He said, For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So the next question that Paul is anticipating from his audience is, okay, granted, not all Jews have believed. But if that's true, and it is, are you saying that God's going back on his promises? Can the unbelief of some cause God to break his word? Think of it like this. J. Vernon McGee kind of summed it up like this. The Jews failed. Doesn't that mean God failed? No. God's promise to send Israel the Redeemer was not defeated by their willful disobedience and rejection. All his promises for the future of the nation will be fulfilled to his glory in spite of their unbelief. Now, my friend, you may not like that, but I personally thank God that his promises to me do not depend on my faithfulness. If it had depended on me, I would have been lost long ago. Thank God for his faithfulness. Amen to that, right? His faithfulness, not mine. Spurgeon said, I have to say with Paul, what if some did not believe? It is no new thing, for there have always been some who have rejected the revelation of God. What then? You and I had better go on believing and testing for ourselves and proving the faithfulness of God and living upon Christ our Lord. 
even though we see another set of doubters and another and yet another. The gospel is no failure, as many of us know. Just because some didn't believe doesn't make God unfaithful, that his words are not going to come to pass. In fact, Paul says, certainly not. That's not the case. And in the Greek, it is in the strongest negative Greek expression. And it carries with it the idea of being impossible. God can never, ever be unfaithful to his promises. It's not his nature. It's not in his character. And we should be thankful for that, that he's faithful, right? Imagine Jesus saying, you know, you have to repent of your sins and ask me to be Lord and Savior of your life and you'll be saved. Maybe. <laughs> that would be horrible, wouldn't it? That's not faithful. When God says it, he means it. Now, Paul, in, in answering this question, quotes out of Psalm 51.4. That's where David came face to face with his sin with Bathsheba and praying for God's forgiveness. And the idea is God's faithful. He will forgive. And when he judges, he's fair. He's righteous. Now, as people look at this world, as they see all the devastation and tragedy that takes place, who do they blame? God. They don't even believe in God and they blame him. You know, it, these are acts of God. You don't even believe in them. What, what is that about, right? But here's the thing, guys. Before the flood, was there any rain or storms? None. In fact, before the sin of Adam, there was no death. But ever since sin occurred in the Garden of Eden, the wickedness of man continued to grow and grow. And then it reached a point where we are told in Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8, then the law, Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Wow, you know, look at this world today. It seems like we're reaching that point where it was in Noah's day, that the thoughts and the intents of man's heart are evil continually, and judgment's coming. But here, God spared Noah and his family to repopulate the earth. He destroyed sinful man, but here's the thing. Noah had the sin nature, and so did his children. And so after the flood, in fact, after the sin of Adam, the death and de decay process began and continues on until Christ comes and redeems this world. Or as Paul said in Romans 8, verses 22 through 23, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. All of creation groans. Why? Because sin has affected every aspect of creation. And we groan. Not only because we hurt in these physical bodies, but we groan over the sin that's out there. The devastation we see and we eagerly wait for the redemption of these bodies. That we don't have to deal with that any longer. You see, Christ paid in full the penalty for our sins, but we still see the effects of sin in this world. And we're still in these bodies of flesh. But Jesus is going to return and restore the earth one day to the way it was when he created it in the first place. In fact, in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9, we're told that the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. While well, we long for that day, where all of creation is living in harmony once again. But there are those that refuse to believe in what God has done for us. But that doesn't make it untrue. Paul's words, indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. 
That's a strong expression Spurgeon wrote. But it's none too strong. If God says one thing and every man in the world says another, God is true. And all men are false. God speaks the truth and cannot lie. God cannot change his word like himself is immutable. We are to believe God's truth if nobody else believes it. The general consensus of opinion is nothing to a Christian. He believes God's word and he thinks more of that than of the universal opinion of men. Wow, you know how important that is. You know, when evolution was starting out, you know who fell prey to this horrible theory? Christians. They let man's word supersede what God's word said. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We would never do that. They were so foolish, weren't they? How could they do something like that? Oh, wait a minute. God really doesn't mean that homosexuality is wrong. It was a problem back in Paul's day, but not for us today. So homosexuality is okay. Well, living together, you know, you got to get to know each other. It's kind of like buying a new car. You got to kick the tires. I hope you don't have that attitude. That's horrible. You're going to kick your spouse or the, the one you want to marry. I hope not. And we go on and on. You know, Marijuana is not bad. It's something God created, so it's okay for us to take. There's a lot of things that God created that are mind-altering drugs that God says no on. But do you see how we let the words of man direct our lives, drive our lives, instead of God really directing our lives? Guys, I don't care what I say or anyone else says. If it goes against what God's word says, negate it. You're going to hear more and more people, supposedly Christian, that are negating God's word. Are you going to believe them? Or are you going to believe what God has said? And that's a choice you're going to have to make. I can't make it for you. No one else can. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to stick with the word of God. Now, the next question that Paul is anticipating, look at verse 5, starting in verse 5. He says, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God is increased through my life to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation, their judgment is just. Now, this is an argument that some will use. It's ridiculous. But what he's basically saying, look, if my unrighteousness will demonstrate God's righteousness, how could God judge me? My sin is ultimately serving to bring him more glory. And isn't that good? So the more I sin, the more glory he gets. Wow, that is warped, huh? But they thought about it and people think about it today. Can you hear Judas make his case? Lord, I know that I betrayed Jesus, but you used it for good. In fact, if I hadn't done what I did, Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross at all. What I did even fulfilled the scriptures. How can you judge me at all? Well, the answer to that is simple. Yes, God used your wickedness, but it was still your wickedness. There was no good or pure motive in your heart at all. It's no credit to you that God brought good out of your evil. You're guilty before God. Exactly. Again, trying to justify our sin. And Paul, in speaking as a man, he's explaining this through the eyes of sinful man, and the reality is, even sinful man would hopefully see this as foolish. It makes no sense. And yet, man attempts to use this at times to justify his behavior. Paul in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2 wrote, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And again, you know, there are those who say, well, you know, if you only teach about grace, you're just opening the door for people to sin. You're giving them an excuse to sin. Are you kidding me? When I truly understand grace, this gift that I don't deserve at all, I want to live for him, Right? I don't want to sin. That's Paul's point in Romans 7. The things I want to do, I don't do. 
The things I don't want to do, I do. Who's going to you know, rescue me from this? And then he comes to Jesus, and it's really in Romans chapter 8, it's the Spirit-filled life. Surrendering to the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. I can't do this on my own because my flesh gets in the way. Again, in Romans 6, verses 15 and 19, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin... You became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. You see, Paul answers that question beginning in verse 6 of Romans 3, and he says, guys, perish the thought. In fact, if this is true, what Paul's, the question that Paul put forth here, could God judge anyone? No. If sin would bring glory to him, I'm sorry, I can't judge anyone. That's, I, I'm shooting myself in the foot. If I judge you because of your sin, then I'm, not, I'm taking away my glory. So it would make no sense. And again, Paul says, that's ridiculous. Don't even think like that. And, and Paul continues on in verses 7 and 8 of Romans 3. He digs deeper. He, he shows us that a person can lay, lie about God, what God has done in their life, and yet the other person is blessed by it and God is glorified. And so how can God judge that person? Because good came out of it. That's the rationale. That's the kind of bizarre thinking. Kind of a situational ethics, I guess. How in the world did people come to conclusions like this? It's really simple. God gives to us this beautiful gift of grace, right? I mean, it is amazing grace. When you really study it and understand what God has given to us, sinful, wicked people, eternal life, forgiveness of our sins. And then, guess what? Satan comes in and perverts the gift. God has given us this wonderful gift. Satan perverts it. And, and Paul, in Romans 6.23, says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Satan comes in then. It says that as Christians, we can do whatever we want. We have a license to sin, and as we do, God gets the glory. You know, how wicked Satan is and how depraved is man. And if that's where your heart is at, you need to do a heart check and see if you're truly saved. But people will make up all kinds of things. God has given sex between a husband and a wife. It's a beautiful thing. What does Satan do? He perverts it. Now we have sex between unmarried people. Now we have sex between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And I'll stop there because it goes even farther than that. Satan perverts what God has given to us. Well, how do I know what to do? God's word tells us. It's simple. Trust what God's word says. It's very clear. And again, you know, in some churches, they will condemn grace because they see it as, wow, so much freedom. You got to rein the people in. You got to hold them in because he let them out there, man. They're just going to go wild, you know? That's ridiculous to me. God's gift to us is free. And yes, we have the liberty to do whatever we want. But our desire, because we love him so much, is that we want to do those things that are pleasing to him. Our works don't save us. They show us that we're saved. So, yeah, all of creation is guilty before God because of their sin. And God has given us a wonderful gift. Now, as we move on here in Romans, chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, Paul's going to show that the whole world is guilty before God. So, you know, if you didn't fit into one of those categories, you know, the uh, unrighteous heathen condemned by creation, the self-righteous moralist condemned by his conscience, or the super-religious person condemned by the law, hang in there, we'll get you, okay? 
Look at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Wow. Now some see this question as the Jews being better than the Gentiles and others see it as the Jews being worse than the Gentiles. That's not really the issue. Both Jews and Gentiles are sinners separated from God. And probably, you know, the question deals with Jews being better than Gentiles. That was their mentality, but that's not the issue. You know, Paul says that we're all under sin. And Paul's point being Jewish is that the Jewish person has no more right with God than a pagan, than a Gentile, a moralist, or whatever. We're all under that same condemnation of sin. And yes, it's true that God chose the Jewish people to be his instruments to not only bring forth the Messiah, but to show, to show others of the true and living God. Was it because they were better than anyone else? Are you kidding me? You've been, we've been through the Old Testament. We've seen they're not better than anyone else. In fact, Deuteronomy 9, verses 5 and 6, he says, It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord, should, Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore, swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. That's pretty straightforward, right? It's not because you're so great. I just chose you. That's it. The bottom line is that we've all sinned, both Jews and Gentiles, and sin has us in bondage with no way to break free on our own. And as we read on, Paul's going to give this 14-count indictment against man. And I, I kind of see God speaking forth these words. They come right out of the Old Testament. This is how God sees man in the flesh. And one Russian poet said it this way. He said, I don't know what the heart of a bad man is like, but I do know what the heart of a good man is like, and it's terrible. Wow. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So let's read on and see how God sees us in our own righteousness. Uh, it's interesting. Look at verse um, 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is God's indictment against man. He looks at the human condition in a sense from top to bottom, you might say. He begins with the head and he moves down to the feet. Uh, Warren Worsby calls it an x-ray study of the lost sinner from head to foot. The entire body of man is filled with sin and rebellion against God. What are you saying, Pastor Joe, that there's no good people out there? I'm not saying that. God is. <laughs> Don't blame me. He's the one who said it. According to God's standard, how many of us are righteous before him? Verse 10 says none. You know what that means in the Greek? None. <laughs> Simple. There's only been one righteous man, and that's Jesus. And apart from God, no one understands God or the condition they're truly in. And unless God draws you, you wouldn't seek after him on your own. Oh, you mean God's drawing some people out? No, he's drawing all people out. How do I know that? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who is wooing people. He is with you. Drawing you to Jesus. And I think that's for every single person on this planet. The Holy Spirit is working, drawing, and we can harden our hearts to what the Holy Spirit is doing. And for the heart of man, it's, it's evil. It's not good. Are some better than others? Yeah, but so what? God requires perfection. And I think what Paul wants us to understand is our complete inability to save ourselves. The fall 
of man touches every part of man's being. And, you know, think about it. What's in our heart will overflow in our lives, the things that we say. And that's what James says. You know, out of our mouth proceed, you know, cursings and blessings. We, we bless God and we curse our fellow man that was created in the image of God. And think about it. Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. I find that an interesting verse because what are people lacking today? Peace. They're running to and fro, fro to find it, right? They're going all over the place. They're looking for someone to bring peace into their lives. But apart from Christ, you're never going to find it. And why does man behave like this? Well, I think verse 18 here in Romans 3 tells us there's no fear of God before their eyes. They don't fear God. They, could, they just feel they could do whatever they want. And when you don't fear God, when you don't have the proper respect for him, then sin will flourish. I don't know if you saw just this week about the kid that was arrested. They were putting in some cement walkways and some kids walked through and this was an older kid and the, the guy who was doing it said, hey, you know, keep an eye on them. They, they just walked through the wet cement here. The kid threw a basketball at them and and when the police came, he was defiant. He didn't see anything wrong with what he did. You see, if there is no fear of God, you'll do whatever you want. I pray for that kid. That somehow, some way, he would come to saving faith. Because that's the only thing that's going to save him. When you don't fear God, when you don't have a proper respect for him, Sin is going to flourish. Every sin and every rebellion against God happens because we don't have the proper respect for him. If you understand who he is, wow, it changes everything. Look at this indictment. Number one, none are righteous. That starts pretty good. Labels everyone. Number two, no one understands God. Number three, no one seeks after God. Number four, they have all turned aside. Number five, sinful man is unprofitable. Number six, there is none who do good. No, not one. Seven, their throat is an open tomb. Eight, they practice deceit with their tongues. Nine, they po the poison of asps is under their lips. Ten, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Eleven, Unregenerate man's feet are swift to shed blood. Twelve, destruction and misery are in their ways. Indictment number 13, unregenerate man does not know the way of peace. And indictment number 14, as we talked about, there is no fear of God before their eyes. One writer put it like this. He said, it's astonishing that men, while they acknowledge that there is a God, should act without any fear of his displeasure. Yet this is their character. They fear a worm of the dust like themselves, but disregard the Most High. They are more afraid of man than of God, of his anger, his contempt, or ridicule. The fear of man prevents them from doing many things from which they are not restrained by the fear of God. They love not his character, not rendering to it that veneration which is due. They respect not his authority. Such is the state of human nature, while the heart is unchanged. Wow, absolutely. This is sinful man. There is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who does good, no, not one. And, you know, you'll look at this world and you go, wow, the things that are happening are incredible. And I think as Christians, as we draw close to God, we see the evil even more. It, it, we almost feel like aliens and strangers in this world, like we don't fit in. You know, the thing, several years ago, well, it's probably been longer than that now, uh, when my son was in college at UW, we went down there. And it was when Bush was in office. And, and we went down there. And I'll tell you what, I felt so out of place. Everyone was protesting against Bush. Everyone was screaming and yelling. It was unbelievable. I'm like, where am I? 
isn't there anyone here who, you know, stands up for what's right? And it didn't seem like it. They just stood up for what they wanted. And that's where we're kind of at in our society today. There's no fear of God, so people do what's right in their own eyes. There's no king on the throne of their heart. Well, look at verse 19 here in Romans 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul points out that this horrific, horrific description of man's utter sinfulness comes to us in the law. And it is intended for those under the law to silence every critic and to demonstrate the universal guilt of mankind. The whole world's guilty before God. And what the law is, is just an instrument to show us our failure to be righteous before God. It's an instrument of condemnation, not justification. Does the law justify any of us? No, because we break the law. What the law does is condemn us. It shows us that we're wrong, and that's the problem. Think of it like this. You know, we, we think, of the, think of the law like a mirror. When you look in the mirror and you see your dirty face, can the mirror do anything to fix that problem? No, it can't, unless it's the Jetsons and, you know, they've got those little hands that come out. But let's forget that. The mirror only could show you what your face looks like. The law could only show you what your life is like. It can't fix the problem. That's why the whole world is condemned before God. The law shows us our utter failure. Paul in Galatians 3, verses 23 through 29, put it like this. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, what the law does is shows us our failure. And it doesn't give us any way to fix that problem. And then comes our Savior, Jesus, who's come to save us from our sins. If you try to live by the law, obtain salvation by the law, you're going to die by the law. James says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. You see, I can keep the law of the land all my life. For whatever reason, though, at one point, I steal something and I get caught. And I'm standing before the judge, and this is my defense. Your Honor, I kept the, whole law, my, I kept the law my whole life. I've only transgressed this once. So it counts for something, right? You know, I can get off, right? I mean, I've done good all my life. It's just this one transgression. And what would the judge say? You're guilty and you have to pay the penalty. Keeping the law your, all your life doesn't win you any points. You're only doing what you were supposed to do. On the spiritual side, Paul says we're all guilty no matter how good we think we are. Again, what did Paul say? There are none righteous, no, not one. There is none that does good, no, not one. Now, I think, man, we've been condemned here for a while. We're all guilty before God. Where's the good news? It's coming. As we read on from Romans 3.21 through Romans 5.21, Paul's going to speak of justification and how the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven apart from the works of the law. Look at verse 21 of Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Paul opens up by saying, but now. And it speaks of the newness of God's work in Jesus Christ. It's the new covenant. Being witnessed by the law and prophets reminds us that there is still continuity with God's work in former times. This isn't something that God said, well, you know, 
I didn't think about this. Now I'm going to have to come up with a new plan. This is the plan all the time. The law and the prophets spoke of salvation being through the Messiah, not the law. That's the new covenant. Read Jeremiah. He spoke of it. Others spoke of it. And Paul really now has moved from the judgment of man into a section on the justification of man apart from the law, a righteousness that is from God. And again, we'll see this through Romans 3.21 through Romans 5.21. Now, as we move into Romans chapter 4 next time, we're going to see Paul illustrate this for us from the laws he speaks of Abraham and then the prophets as he speaks of David. And we have to understand that God's righteousness that has been given to us is not in addition to the law, but as Paul said, it's apart from the law. The law doesn't save us. Jesus does. It's a free gift extended to all, and then it's up to each individual to either receive it and believe it or reject it and not believe what God has for them. But there is no other way to obtain this righteousness. It's not earned through obedience to the law. It's received righteousness gained through faith in Jesus Christ. Spurgeon wrote this. He said, There is a little book entitled, Every Man Has His Own Lawyer. Well, nowadays, according to some people, it seems as if every man is to be his own savior. But if I had, say, a dozen gospels, and I had to sort them out and give the right gospel to the right man, what a fix I should be in. I believe that, oftentimes, I should be giving your gospel to someone else, and someone else's gospel to you, and what a muddle it would all be. But now we have one universal cure. The blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ will save every man who trusts him, for there is no difference. No difference. He's speaking of the fact salvation is available to all. You hear today, well, you know, you can believe whatever you want, all roads, roads lead to God. That's not what the Bible says. Salvation is available only through Jesus Christ for Jews and Gentiles. Now, some still struggle with this idea, thinking good works or the law adds to our salvation. You know, God will love me more if I do this and I do that, or I don't do this and I don't do that. And Paul's going to talk more about that as we read on. But think about this. Is God's love for you conditional? Really? How do you know that? Because it's an agape love. It's an everlasting love. It's a love that's not based on what I have done. It's a love that's based in Him. Unconditional. He loved me while I was still a sinner. So how much... He, he can't love me anymore, and He can't love me any less. And you know what? There's great peace and joy in that. I like that. Look at what Paul says next, though. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you know what the word all means in the Greek? All. You guys are learning. It's slow. It's been 23 years, but you're learning. Of course, it means all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that word sin means miss the mark. It's, think of it like an archer. The mark is the bullseye. And does it matter if you miss it by an inch or, you know, you hit the guy over standing on the far side? No, it doesn't matter how close you are. If you miss the mark of the bullseye, you miss perfection. And that's what God is saying. He, need, he, he wants sinless perfection if we are going to come before him. It's his perfect standard. All have sinned. Not just some or a few, but all. We fall short. And this is in the present tense stating an action or that we keep falling short. Do you feel that way? Of course we do. We all feel that we keep falling. Oh, man, I wish I would have done this, but I wish I didn't do that. I wish I didn't say that. I wish I didn't say this. We fall short. We keep falling short. So if our salvation is based on our actions, we're all doomed. None of us are going to make it. But it's based upon his faithfulness, his promise to us, his work that he finished. Now, since all have missed the mark of perfection, it doesn't matter if you miss by an inch or a million miles, you still miss the mark of perfection, and you won't get to heaven by your own efforts, your good works, by keeping the law, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
then what can we do? Paul answers that. Look at verse 24. Being justified freely, without any cost in a sense, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're justified. Freely justified. No cost we had to pay. And the word justified speaks of rendering innocent, to be righteous. God has freely given us that verdict. It's just if I'd never sinned, justified. That's what God has done for us. It's not that God ignores our sin, because that would make him unrighteous. What has happened is that Jesus has paid in full the penalty for our sins, all of them, and now there is no record of our sins any longer. Can you imagine that? When you go to heaven, if you don't believe me, say, Lord, I want to see my file cabinet with my sins in it. Uh, there's no record of it. It's not there. Uh, Warren Worsby tells the following story about a Rolls Royce, and this kind of really drives home this point of what justification is all about. He says, my friend Dr. Roy Gustafson has the finest illustration of justification I've ever heard. It seems that there was a man in England who put his Rolls Royce on a boat and went across to the continent to go on a holiday. While he was driving around Europe, something happened to the motor of his car. He cabled the Rolls-Royce people back in England and asked, I'm having trouble with my car. What do you suggest I do? Well, the Rolls-Royce uh, people flew a mechanic over. The mechanic repaired the car and flew back to England and left the man to continue his holiday. Well, as you can imagine, the fellow was wondering, how much is this going to cost me? So when he got back to England, he wrote the people a letter and asked how much he owed them. And he received a letter from the office that read this. Dear Sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything ever went wrong with a Rolls Royce. That's justification. There is no record any longer. And we need to understand that fact. Yes, we are all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but in Christ we are justified freely. We can't purchase it, but we can receive it. It's a grace gift. We don't deserve it. It's a grace gift. That's what grace is all about. And Paul tells us we have redemption through Jesus. And the idea of redemption is buying back something, and it involves a cost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, we were slaves to sin, and Jesus came and redeemed us from that bondage. He freely paid the cost. And we didn't add anything to this redemption. We just received it by faith. Now, there is another thing that Paul speaks of regarding what the Lord has done for us. And we'll read on. Look at verse 25 here on Romans 3. Whom God sent forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus, by his death, became the substitute sacrifice for us, the propitiation for our sins. When he hung on the cross of Calvary, he was judged in our place as the sins of the world were placed upon him. And so the Father could demonstrate his righteousness in judgment against sin while sparing us who deserved his judgment. Jesus took our punishment for us. The word propitiation means the satisfying of God's holy law. That's what God has given to us. And the price was his blood that had to be shed. And this word propitiation in the Greek, it's used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, for mercy seat. That was the lid that covered the Ark of the Covenant where the law of God was kept. And on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of a goat upon the mercy seat to turn, atone for the sins of the people. Jesus has come to be that perfect sacrifice and take away, not cover our sins. He is our mercy seat. His blood was shed. You see, if the lid was off, well then, what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God, right? Then we're judged by the law, 
and we're all guilty. But God has now saved us. His mercy, not giving us what we deserve. And it was the shed blood, not the animal sacrifice, but God's sacrifice for us that has cleansed us from our sins. The perfect sacrifice. Not covering them for a time, but taking them away. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the sins of mankind, past, present, future, were laid on the on Jesus when he hung on that cross at Calvary. Three hours of darkness from noon to 3 p.m. When the wrath of God was placed upon him, when he bore our sins, and the Father turned his face from the Son. Wow. Clark put it like this. Here we learn that God designed to give the most evident displays of both his justice and mercy, of his justice in requiring our sacrifice, and absolutely refusing to give the salvation to a lost world in any other way, and of his mercy in providing the sacrifice, which is justice required exactly. Remember, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, right? What does that mean? Keep in mind, in the temple, there were no chairs. The priests were always sacrificing, working, because the work was never finished. But Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, signifying the work was finished, paid in full. Not only was the work finished, but the Father accepted the work of the Son. Wow. Look at verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified, declare righteous, by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Guys, I should have told you this, how good of a person I am. I mean, you guys are so fortunate to have such a wonderful guy as me. Why are you laughing? That hurts. Because you know it's, it's not true, right? Forget about it, as my Italian family would say. There's no room for boasting for our salvation. Why? Because it's not based on how good we are. Oh, God needed me. He must have needed me to save me. No, he didn't need me. He uses a donkey in the Old Testament to speak for him. He didn't need us. He doesn't need us. And thus, who do we boast? Who do we praise? We praise God for what he has done, not what we have done. And the bottom line is this, because many miss it. When our salvation is based upon the principle of faith, there is absolutely, absolutely no room for boasting. The justified person says, I did all the sinning. Jesus did all the saving. That's the correct perspective to have. Paul said in verse 28, a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Look at verse 29. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So, there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Paul in Romans 2.11 says, there is no partiality with God. And not only is the righteousness of God in Christ available to both Jews and Gentiles, it's received the same way by grace through faith. You know, remember the early church had a problem. Some Jews were saying that Gentiles needed to keep the law of Moses, and, or uh, some of the Jews were saying Gentiles needed to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. And Peter said in Acts 15, Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. I find that interesting. Peter says, what are you doing? We couldn't keep the law. Our fathers couldn't keep the law. Our ancestors couldn't keep the law. Now we want to put this on the Gentiles? Are you kidding me? And then he says something that I think the Holy Spirit just used 
use it so powerfully. We believe, he said, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we, Jews, shall be saved in the same manner as they. Well, how are they saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. How are the Jews saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Is that simple? This is not complicated. This is basic Christianity. Now, what is Paul talking about when he says, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? I don't know why he uses different prepositions here, by and through, but there is no difference in the instrumental cause of justification. It's faith in both cases. So why he did that, I don't know, but it doesn't change the fact that they're saved by faith, both Jews and Gentiles. Well, look at verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So here's the thing. If we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, someone may ask, well, if the law doesn't make us righteous, what good is it? Paul, you made the law void. You're going against the law of God. No, that's not what Paul is doing. Paul tells us the gospel establishes the law. How? Well, the law demands perfection, right? A bullseye, you might say. If you break the law, and we all do, then there's a penalty that has to be paid for because we broke the law. What's the penalty? Death. Eternal separation from God. That's the penalty. And for us to pay the debt for breaking the law, we have to die and be eternally separated from God. That's our debt we pay. That's all we could do. We would be lost forever. We can't save ourselves. And that brings us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel tells us how God became flesh, dwelt among us to pay and fold the penalty for our sins. And it's a free gift to all, but you have to receive it by faith. So the gospel of salvation by faith upholds the law by insisting that its utmost demands must be and have been fully met in Jesus. Yeah, the law is important. Its purpose is fulfilled when it exposes our sin. It shows us how we've come short of perfection, which God requires. And it brings us to our Savior. It brings us to Jesus. That's why Paul spent almost three chapters dealing with this issue of all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, one writer put it like this. He said, as far as salvation is concerned, the gospel does not replace the law because the law was never a means of salvation. The law was given to show men the perfect standard of God's righteousness and to show that those standards are impossible to meet in man's own power. The purpose of the law was to drive men to faith in God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus declared God's perfect standards to be higher even than those of the Old Covenant. A person breaks God's law, he said, not only by killing, but even by hating. Not only by committing adultery, but by having lustful thoughts. If it's impossible to fulfill perfectly the Mosaic law, how much more impossible is it to keep the standard set forth by Christ in his earthly ministry? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, praise the Lord for his indescribable gift that he's given to us, his son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus paid in full the penalty for our sins. You know, don't be like many today who think their righteousness will get them into heaven. It won't. Here's the thing, and just get this picture in your mind. Sorry, but just get your picture in your mind. Apart from Christ, the emperor has no clothes. That's the reality. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful gift, the gift of life that's found in Jesus, the forgiveness of our sins. And that that debt was fully paid. And Lord, your promises we can trust in. You will never go back on your word. And we are so thankful for that. And Lord, I pray this wonderful gift you've given to us, we would share with others. That others would see how precious our Lord is. And that he loves people so much that he was willing to die for them. Lord, help us to live lives that would honor you and draw people to you. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.